Good morning. I'm the Reverend Diane Daugert. My pronouns are she and her, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to worship with the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. On Sunday mornings, we bring our whole selves, our many names for the divine, our diverse spiritual paths, and join together in worship. As Unitarian Universalists, we don't share a common creed, but covenant together to affirm our interdependence, celebrate our differences, and work for justice. We are a welcoming congregation, and we deepen our relationships as we serve our congregation's mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, and act on our values in the larger world, guided by reason and compassion. I have just a few brief announcements. Our Sunday programming for children and youth resumes in February, and you can learn more about that programming by visiting our website, firstuunash.org. Food and show tickets for February 12th, opening our Home for Habitat fundraiser, are on sale now. And you can also find out more about that show and how to purchase tickets at the website. And finally, our mid-year congregational meeting is today, approximately 10 minutes after our service ends this morning. Meeting materials are also posted on our website. All are encouraged to attend, including children and youth. Marguerite Mills, our Director of Lifespan Faith Development, tells us it's like taking them to the voting booth with you, a perfect example of how we honor our fifth principle. We covenant to affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. So I hope I will see you all um, back here for the congregational meeting 10 minutes after the service ends. We are so glad you have joined us for worship this morning. Hello, my name is Julie Grower. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a proud member of your first UU Nashville choir. I'll be your song leader for today. Please join me in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 145, As Tranquil Streams. The lyrics will be on your screen.
the words for our call to worship were written by Sean Neal Barron. Your body is welcome here, all of it. Yes, even that part, and that part, and yes, even that part. The parts you love and the parts you don't. For in this place, we come with all that we are, all that we have been, and all that we are going to be. Our bodies are constantly changing. Cells die and cells are reborn. We respond to infections and disease. Sometimes we can divorce them from our bodies and other times they become permanently part of us. Your body and all that is within it, both wanted and not wanted, has a place here. Our bodies join in a web of co-creation, created and creating, constantly changing, constantly changing us, scarred and tattooed, tense and relaxed, diseased and cured, unfamiliar and intimate, formed in infinite diversity of creation. Your body is welcome here, all of it. So take a moment and welcome it. Take a moment to feel in it. Take a moment to be in it. Let us worship together. The words for the chalice lighting were written by Leslie Takahashi. We gather as many drops, each winding our own path down life's surfaces and ruts. Here, we pool together as a single body, flowing together for a time. Together, we are a stream, at times, even a river. For with our shared course, we can travel across ocean, meaning and seas of connection. In the spirit of connection, we light our challenge. Good morning. I'm Marguerite Mills, your director of Lifespan Religious Education. And my pronouns are she, her. My story today, I decided that this would be a good time to tell you a little bit about my father. William Frederick Mills was born in 1920. So he grew up during the Great Depression. He was six foot two with a full head of thick wavy hair that only started to thin a bit at the crown. He was a public school teacher. My friend said he had eyes like George Clooney. He drove like a New Yorker, which he learned in what we called the city, including the traditional verbal commentary. And he also had the patience to make a proper roux like he had learned how to do in Alabama. He wasn't the best father when my sister and I were young and not the worst. But by the time I reached young adulthood, he had learned how to be quite a good one. In 1987, he was living in Houston, Texas, and so was I. He called me one day and said he had to talk and he was coming over right then. Uh, this was not something he'd ever done before and it made me feel somewhat anxious. To this day, I can still see us sitting in my living room as he told me, he was HIV positive. He was 67 years old. My father was adamant that he did not want me to tell a soul 
the stigma in those years was pretty horrible. When he learned sometime later that I told a friend, he was furious. But we both learned a lot in this journey. And when I explained that it was just one person who I trusted and needed, because he was not the only one going through this, he got it. Anyway, the next few years went both quickly and slowly. Some days were good, some bad. Some started good and got bad. There was one time when I was picking him up at the airport and I waited and I waited and I watched all of the passengers come out. Some with baggage, some with kids, some laughing, some making a beeline for the restrooms. And the anxiety in my gut was winding tighter and tighter. And then I saw him being wheeled out by an airport employee. He looked awful, trouble, getting a breath, clearly fatigued soul-crushingly exhausted. It was not too long after that that I convinced him after much pleading to get a handicap placard for his card. He hated to use it. He was a proud man, independent and a little vain. But again, he had those George Clooney eyes and that full hair of glory, head of glorious white hair. So maybe he had a little something to be vain about. And there was always that need to hide what it was that he had, which by that time was full-blown AIDS. So he'd pull into a handicapped parking lot and get out of the car looking for all the world like a healthy older gentleman. Sometimes he'd get stares. And whether he did or not, he always felt somehow wrong. I am just grateful that no one ever actually said anything to him. I'd hope the New Yorker would have come out in him, but I'm afraid he would have been too ashamed and too bone weary to summon that. But it was like that time on the plane, a few steps, a little time, and he needed that parking spot. Just because he didn't want to show it doesn't mean he didn't need it. We both learned so much about ourselves and each other and how we moved through the world. Bill Mills died in 1991. He was 71 years old. He was many things, some of which he didn't want too many people to know about. Although I believe now that he would want me to tell you about him. He was many things. He was my father. And so ends the story. Thank you for that story, Marguerite. You may know that we share every Sunday's collection with an organization whose work outside our walls aligns with our values. Our Share the Plate partner for the month of January is the Healing Arts Project, providing opportunities for persons in mental health and addiction recovery to promote healing, community awareness, and inclusion. The offering is a sacrament of the Free Church it is supported by the voluntary generosity of all who join with us.
each time we gather. We bring our joys, our concerns, and our sorrows with us. In this rapidly changing time, as we seek to make our ways of worship open and accessible during this time of pandemic, we have yet to work out the technology to share your joys and concerns with the congregation as a whole. But know that you can make your joy or your concern known to your lay ministry team by using the link in the chat and filling out the form. Your lay ministers, as always, are ready to be companions with you in the joys and sorrows of life. By way of prayer today, I have words written by Thich Nhat Hanh, beloved teacher to many, who died yesterday at the age of 95. The great teacher that he was, known by people the world over, his actions and his words will live on. May we honor his life as we mourn his death by taking these words into our hearts and minds. Thich Nhat Hanh writes, We have a tendency to think in terms of doing and not in terms of being. We think that when we are not doing anything, we are wasting our time. But that is not true. Our time is, first of all, for us to be. To be what? To be alive, to be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving. And that is what the world needs most. In memory of Thich Nhat Hanh, fondly known as Tay, let us take a moment of silence just to be. Please join me in body or spirit as we sing Spirit of Life, hymn number 123. The reading for today is titled Wild Emancipation for All of Us. It's an excerpt from the book, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body, 
by Rebecca Towson. When I was small and just learning how to do life in my body, I didn't hesitate, didn't hold back, didn't worry how it would look, didn't look for cues or ask for my line. My imagination ruled. I was entirely free to be driven by the innovation my body inspired. This is the wild emancipation I wish for all of us, a world where we are all free to be, to move, to exist in our bodies without shame, a world that isn't interested in making all of its humans operate in the exact same way, a world that instead strives to invite more, include more, imagine more. That world sees the humans existing on the margins and says, you have what we want. What barriers can we remove so we can have you around? What do you need? How can we make that happen? In my pre-ministry days, I worked as a case manager for an agent, agency whose mission was to provide support services to people with disabilities in their homes. It was the first time in my working life that I actually had co-workers with visible disabilities. And the first place where in the staff break room, it was common over coffee for co-workers to talk openly about their invisible disabilities, such as mood disorders, learning disabilities, post-traumatic stress, mental illness, and chronic fatigue. In that room, there was no stigma attached, just people being who they were. This ragtag group of case managers was the most diverse group I have ever been part of, though we did have a ways to go to be fully representative of the ethnic and racial diversity of the clients we served. It was the closest in my life that I have come to an embodiment of the inclusive, welcoming, and diverse beloved community we dream about and strive toward. As we case managers set off to make our home visits, we would remind each other that any one of us is only one accident, one injury, or one illness away from becoming disabled. Our clients had taught us well that any of us, at best, is only temporarily abled. The clients I served included people with schizophrenia, paraplegia and quadriplegia, double and triple amputees, people with multiple sclerosis, HIV AIDS, and dementia. As a Unitarian Universalist, my clients back then taught me the prophecy of the disabled body, that if we believe that all persons have inherent worth and dignity, then we believe that all bodies have inherent worth and dignity, no matter their size or shape or color or age or condition or ability. The daily reminder that at best, we are all only temporarily abled, instilled in me a deep desire to live my life from a place of compassion. Not that I always do it, but that desire is always there. I'm reminded of the saying from some anonymous source that says everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind, always. The prophecy of the disabled body 
goes beyond our principle of human worth and dignity, even beyond our principles of compassion and acceptance of one another. It speaks to the truth that our society is built on the assumption of able-bodiedness. When you think of it, most everything is built with able bodies in mind, from our homes, office buildings, schools, shops, and restaurants, and even our transportation system is built with able bodies in mind. In our society, accommodations for disabilities are all too often afterthoughts and add-ons, if available at all, rather than being built in from the very beginning. Disabled bodies are rarely represented in movies, television, or print media, and when they are, it too often reinforces the ableist belief that one cannot live a fulfilling life in a disabled body. Disabled bodies are mostly portrayed as either objects of pity or inspiring superheroes whose deepest desire is to be cured or fixed. This pervasive ableism shapes the way we view people with disabilities and the way people with disabilities view themselves. The title of today's sermon, The Prophecy of the Disabled Body, is taken from a report from the Ableism Task Force of the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association, which defines ableism as the centering of able bodies and experiences over disabled bodies, while simultaneously devaluing and erasing those disabled bodies. For some, disability is a permanent reality. Others move in and out of different degrees of disability throughout their lives. We all experience aches and pains, illnesses and injuries, times when our bodies don't fit the ideal image of health and fitness that our larger culture would have us believe to be the norm. The truth is that we are all only temporarily abled, and that became apparent to me a few years back when something shifted in my knee and I could no longer walk without intense pain. My doctor apologetically told me that the non-invasive arthritis treatments I had been using would no longer work. My only option was total knee replacement surgery. And I tell this to people often, that it's become a very common surgery and the outcomes are really good, but that's not all that comforting when it's your knee and your surgery. So my only option was total knee replacement, and the irony is that the shift in my knee happened while I was working out at the gym, striving after that image of a fit and healthy body. Some vivid memories of that time still stand out for me. A couple weeks post-surgery, I made my first venture out in public. My husband, AJ, took me out for breakfast and then to the grocery store. And following my physical therapist's advice, I used a walker to protect my still healing knee. At the restaurant, a place where we had eaten many, many times before, the waitress took AJ's order and then looked at me and then, then looked at my walker and then turned back to AJ and asked, and what would your wife like? It was as if the walker had made me incapable of speaking for myself. I felt erased. Then, at the grocery store, not once, not 
not twice, but three times, three different people ran into me with their shopping carts. And each time they said the same thing. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you. Even when they had been looking straight at me as they ran their cart into me. I felt not only a little bit frightened, but invisible. A couple weeks later, I flew to another city to preach at the installation service of a colleague, a commitment I had made long before I knew I needed surgery. By then, I had progressed from a walker to a cane, but still wasn't getting around as well as I would have liked. I navigated the step up to the chancel area of the sanctuary where someone had thoughtfully provided me a stool to sit on while at the pulpit. And then after the service, I used the elevator to get to the reception on the lower level of the church building. All was well until it came time to use the restroom. Seeing the short flight of stairs between me and the restroom, my heart sank. I decided the wiser course was to take the long walk back to the elevator, up to the first floor, and down another long hallway. Like so many of our congregations, this one had made valiant efforts to make their building accessible, and yet, all the obstacles I wouldn't have noticed before were now, as apparent, as if they were bright neon signs. Rebecca Tosic, author of the book Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary, Resilient, Disabled Body, was diagnosed with cancer when she was 18 months old, and she became paralyzed at the age of three a result of the chemotherapy and radiation and surgery that had saved her life. Her book is candid and beautiful, weaving together stories from her own life with illuminating insights from the field of disability theory in which she holds a PhD. The book opened my eyes and changed my mind about things I thought I knew. She writes, instead of disability as the limitation, what if a lack of imagination was the actual barrier? She goes on to say, this is the wild emancipation I wish for all of us. And she asks the questions, what barriers can we remove so we can have you around? What do you need? How can we make that happen? These, my friends, are the questions of radical hospitality, of welcoming the stranger into our midst without stigma, without shame, including the estranged parts of ourselves, we push to the margins of consciousness because they are deemed unacceptable by our larger society. To Rebecca Tausig's questions, I would add one more. What barriers can we remove so that we can truly welcome the most vulnerable of bodies? into our community? What barriers can we remove to truly welcome the most vulnerable, vulnerable bodies into our community? Inclusion of disabled bodies is about more than elevators and ramps. Not that these aren't important, indeed they are vital. Still, they are a beginning, not the end, of our wild imagination of what is possible. Just as being welcoming of black bodies, brown bodies,
bodies, indigenous bodies, queer bodies, and trans bodies means examining our own preconceptions and prejudices and understanding of our own internalized isms about race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. It's about unearthing deeply ingrained beliefs, so ingrained that we accept things the way they are, as if they are unchangeable. That ragtag community of caseworkers and the people we served showed me that another way is possible, that our deepest desires are much the same, to exist in our bodies without shame, to live lives of meaning and purpose, to love and to be loved. Isn't this what we all desire? The prophecy of the disabled body is that all bodies have inherent worth and dignity, that the beloved community is only possible to the extent that includes all bodies, that we are all children of the same earth, children of the universe, all made of stardust, all inhabitants of this beautiful blue-green earth that is home to us all. May we make of it the beloved community we seek. Amen and blessed be. Please join me in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 1064, Blue Boat Home.
A Chalice Extinguishing is written by Elizabeth Sell Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of community, sorry, the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Before I leave you with words of benediction, I remind you that the congregational meeting begins, it looks like we'll be beginning pretty promptly at 11 o'clock. Please do remember to come back and join us. The words were of the benediction were written by John Cummins, Universalist Minister of Blessed Memory. May we never rest until every child of the earth in every generation is free from all prisons of the mind and of the body and of the spirit. Until the earth and the hills and the seas shall dance and the universe itself resound with the joyful cry, Behold, I am. This service has ended. May our service to the world continue renewed. Go in peace, go in love, but do come back for the congregational meeting.